Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us after lunch. I know it's not easy to start after lunch. Um, so we are now on the session of talking about financing, especially Recording financing in progress. for um, electrical mobility. Um, our session will be made of three presentations and then followed by a round table. Uh, we will have presenters online and presenters on site. So um, we will have Julia Guion uh, from the International Energy Agency, Petros Makaropoulos, uh, project manager from the Network of Sustainable Greek Islands, uh, Raul Sinhat, an investor on the um, Energy Efficiency, um, European Energy Efficiency Fund, sorry, uh, Maria Cilia, uh, research fellow at St 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 Stockholm Environmental Institute, and uh, Evangelos Beccaris, uh, vice president of the Center of Research and Technologies of Ellis and president of the Atlantic Institute for Electrical Vehicles. So we have a panel that I call a state of the art or a top tier panel. So we have the best experts with us. That's, uh, I will invite you to make a lot of questions. Um, hello to everyone that is online also um, and to our speakers. So I will now give the floor to, to Julia to present uh, um, a policy document on electrical mobility and then we will move uh, for a presentation uh, on site with Petros um, that will talking about experience on islands and how we can do this without leaving anything or anyone behind to make sure that is uh, uh, energy transition, but an inclusive energy transition. And then I will give the floor to Raul to talk about um, the perspective of an investor. So a completely different perspective, but we go from policy level to investment level, and then we move for the, the, um, the round table. I will not take more time because we are running a little bit delay. Um, so I will give you the floor. Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, George. And okay. uh, hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me and that uh, the screen is visible to everyone. I take that as a yes. Um, so uh, for those of you that um, don't know uh, what the International Energy Agency is, I will give a very quick introduction to the agency uh, in my first part of the presentation. Uh, but first of all, uh, let me say a few words about myself. I'm uh, Julia Grillon. I'm an energy analyst within the International Energy Agency in the Renewable Integration and Secure Electricity Unit. And uh, in this uh, frame, I've been working together with the Global Environment Facility on a global program to support countries with the shift to electric mobility. And this policy brief on public charging infrastructure is the first deliverable of working group four of this uh, global program. Working group four is targeting charging infrastructure and grid in integration. And so this is really the first one looking at charging infrastructure and providing policy recommendations to promote the successful rollout strategies and business models. So um, without further ado, I will, as I mentioned, talk a bit about the IEA and then dive into the policy brief. I'll try to keep the presentation short, but really uh, don't hesitate to note down any points that you would like explained uh, further in the question section. So the International Energy Agency, it was created in 1974 after the first oil shock. And basically the uh, goals were to ensure reliable energy supplies, to promote energy efficiency, and to encourage the technological research and innovation. And now our scope has moved a bit and really shifted towards the fight against climate change, which is at the heart of our activities. Um, and to uh, look at these and to basically help policymakers address the fight against climate change, we provide data analysis and policy recommendations. One of our flagship publications is the Net Zero by 2050 roadmap, um, something that I will uh, quote a few um, outlines from in my presentation. So that brings me on the policy brief on public charging infrastructure. Let's have a look first why we are actually looking at this. Uh, we're looking at, first of all, trying to decarbonizing the economy. And if we look at world CO2 emissions from fuel combustion, we see that the road transport sector 
is 18% of these emissions, so it's quite consequent. And in this uh, IEA net zero scenario that I've mentioned, the power sector is one of the first sectors to decarbonize. That's why we say to, elect to decarbonize road transport, we need to move in electrifying road transport. This is really going to be one of our main levers to decarbonize the sector. And one of the things you need for people to actually accept moving to electric vehicles is charging infrastructure because there is something called range anxiety, the fear of not being able to reach destination, and it has been proven to be one of the key barriers to EV adoption, EV electric vehicle. Uh, one, you have several surveys on the right side of the screen. I'm just going to mention one in the EU. 58% of internal combustion engine drivers mentioned that the driving range, so basically the uh, distance that they can drive with the electric vehicle is one of the main reasons for not switching to electric vehicles. And we can address this driving range if we have more charging infrastructure. So policymakers really should look at this and try uh, to have more available charging infrastructure because it will allow visibility, uh, trust from drivers, it will allow making sure that there is accessible charging infrastructure for all and optimizing the battery size so that we try to avoid having really overdimensioned battery sizes to address this range anxiety. So that's why we say electrification of road transport cannot happen without charging infrastructure deployment and without public charging infrastructure deployment. Looking at charging infrastructure, it's a little bit different, as most of you in the room surely know, uh, than the infrastructure that we need to refuel the car. Why? Because it's very diverse. You can recharge your electric vehicle in very different locations. And this is what this figure is trying to show. Um, you have here privately and publicly accessible locations. And they are very diverse and they tailor to different use cases and to different business models. And I will go through the different business models depending on their location uh, for publicly available infrastructure, which is really where policymakers have a strong role. So first of all, roadside charging. Roadside charging is as in the picture, uh, charging often in a city at the parking space. And in this case, most charging speeds are possible. Slow charging, if it's an overnight or longer duration parking, will be suitable but it could also be a fast charging hubs in cities. To install this infrastructure, the motivations are to complement or replace home charging, to diminish coverage gaps, and to address a wider set of use cases. For example, those drivers that don't have access to charging at home. Grid services, where the utility provides signals to charge or stop charging uh, because of demand, are possible, especially for longer dwell times, where it will be easier to shift these charge times. And one example can be found in Stockholm. Stockholm has mapped out suitable locations for such street side chargers. Then, en route charging, which is represented here on the side of the highway, but it could also be um, on the side of an of a inter intracity road, for example. The idea is really you're going from A to B, and you cannot reach your destination without topping up, uh, without recharging a little bit. So that's where you will go to an en route charging station. And that's why mostly this will be fast charging because here you don't want um, to be waiting too long. You really want to move on and reach your destination. Motivations to install this are long range journeys, tourism, and the grid services will be more limited because of this emphasis on charging speed. We have an example in France that has tendered out uh, their highway charging infrastructure. Then destination charging, if I go back to my example of the A to B, this is basically the B. You arrive at destination, a shopping mall, for example, a hospital like in this uh, figure, uh, or also an amusement park or a tourist location, and you leave your car there and then you can charge it while you do uh, something else. So here, all types of charging are possible, again, depending on uh, the type uh, of destination, on the dwell time at destination. The motivations for a business to install this are to attract business, to attract consumers, for additional revenue streams, and for tourism. 
grid services here will be possible, again, depending on the dwell times. And you have several businesses that provide turnkey charging as a service uh, for such, uh, such locations. Then something that is a little less uh, deployed currently is shared home or work charging. So home and work charging are classified as privately accessible, but if they are shared, if the owner of the home charging station, for example, or the, or the plug decides that he wants to open it up to someone else, then it becomes shared. And then it can be actually a publicly accessible or semi-publicly accessible charging infrastructure. In this case, it will be primarily slow charging and the motivations for the owner are revenue generation. And in the more systemic view, it's an efficient use of existing infrastructure because you share the one available plug with as many people as possible. Grid services here are possible and you have example of these kind of business models with different sharing applications with community charging. Then I'm going to skip over the last one in my figure, the battery swapping, because this is a little bit less relevant for the EU um, context. But if there are questions, don't hesitate. I'm happy to go a bit uh, further into this uh, in the question session. Because this brings me now to our five main recommendations to policymakers to ensure an efficient rollout of charging infrastructure. The first one is to break down the silos. It's very important to understand that charging infrastructure will need um, cooperation between different sectors that don't often cooperate, like the transport sector, the power sector, the real estate, and but they need to come together and look at the different challenges that they know of their expertise and work together to address them. And then it's also important to look at the different levels from the national to the local level. If there are only strategies at the national level, but at the local level where actually the infrastructure is implemented, no one knows exactly what to do, that doesn't work. So cooperation through the levels is important. For that, try to designate contact persons and to provide training so that every uh, person working in this uh, field knows exactly what are the processes. Then tailor your strategy. Um, as I've mentioned before, charging infrastructure is very diverse. It can tailor to different use cases. It can be slow, fast, uh, on, on along the highway, in the city. It's, it's really quite diverse. So it's important when deciding what to install to first know, okay, what are my needs? Um, what is the picture of my jurisdiction? So collect the relevant data to understand this and then uh, install the infrastructure that best tailors to that. And of course, to try to be efficient um, and not install too much infrastructure, encourage modal shifts towards public transportation, for example, where it is possible. Then showcase electric vehicle charging as a political priority. This will be very important to attract investment because the public governments won't be able to fund for all the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So we want competition. We want uh, private investors to come in and build out charging infrastructure. And for that, it's important to set the scene to show, okay, this is something that we care about. And then also to streamline the processes so that it's clear for someone coming in, this is what I need to do. Uh, to install a charging infrastructure. And this is the data. Uh, this is how I can um, proceed. Force is encourage standardization. First, in terms of user information and reliability, it's important that users know uh, that they will access a charging in, uh, station that they can use with their car, with their vehicle, but that is also functioning. So select codes and standards and ensure that there is interoperability. This is something that we have seen in Europe a lot, that uh, people had to have several different cards uh, to use several charging uh, stations. So try to avoid, learn from this basically, and try to see how to make this more harmonized. And lastly, future-proof your infrastructure. A very important one in the sense that you don't want to build out something that will be obsolete in two, three, four, five years. Uh, so build the targets into the planning to know already 
what uh, you want to install. Promote smart metering and smart charging because this will allow to minimize the impact of electric vehicles and to actually work with the grid, with the utilities to minimize the impact on the peak load and encourage low carbon electricity use. Uh, I've mentioned it at the beginning of my presentation. Our aim is to decarbonize the sector. This is only possible if we try to charge our electric vehicles with as much renewable electricity as possible. And I'll stop there. And I'm very much looking forward to the questions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Uh, um, you were really efficient because you did a great presentation and you used the 12 minutes exactly. So <laughs> this was really great. Thank you for, for this and for, for setting up the scene. Uh, I think that it was relevant. Um, the document is available for download at the um, International Energy Agency website. So if you have more interest, you can also download it. But we will move to questions afterwards, so you have plenty of time for also for questions. Now I would invite Petros to give a different view, a more local view, and talking a little bit more about how we can do this using these business models, but in a way that you don't leave anyone behind. Petros, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We're really happy to, to be here and uh, discuss uh, all these uh, interesting projects uh, about uh, e-mobility. Um, so we will focus on um, examples from the local, the island scale. And uh, just a few words about the uh, Daphne Network. It's a public interest, non-profit organization of the island local and uh, regional authorities in Greece, uh, promoting sustainable development in uh, Greek islands. Um, also, we've been a subcontractor of the Secretariat during the, the first term and uh, to the Covenant of Mayors, assisting islands in energy planning. Um, so, uh, regarding the projects that we've been uh, working on, uh, the first uh, really interesting example were, was the smart, the smart electromobility in uh, Syros, where we had the luck to work together with the Secretariat and, uh, of course, the Center for Renewable Energies uh, of Greece, um, where we tried to have a, a study promoting e-mobility in the island of Syros. Syros happens to be uh, the birthplace of the first uh, Greek electrical uh, vehicle, Enfield uh, 8000. Um, and uh, building on this tradition, uh, it aspires to become an island model for the transition to e-mobility. And uh, new uh, services that uh, uh, are provided to residents and visitors. Um, the, the study included the uh, electrification of the municipal fleet, installation of a publicly accessible EV charging network, uh, installation of solar PVs to cover the charging needs, and the establishment of an energy community for the management uh, of the network and the public uh, fleet. Uh, regarding the, the technical support, we uh, the, the result was a very interesting uh, report uh, that includes best practices, business models, uh, regulatory barriers and solutions, and of course, uh, local policy, policy recommendations. Um, it was uh, very interesting to, to see how the, the challenges of islands, especially regarding seasonality, can be taken into account um, while uh, dealing with uh, uh, EV charging infrastructure and uh, how, uh, especially on islands, a joint venture model where um, the public, especially the local authorities and the uh, private sector are working together uh, to face the insular challenges. Um, then uh, there's the example of smart and sustainable island, uh, Astipalea. Uh, where there is a really interesting ongoing project uh, promoted by Volkswagen, five uh, Greek ministries, um, and uh, some other partners. We participate as a, um, a technical advisor to the municipality of Astipalea. Uh, the project there uh, also has a, an integrated approach that is uh, really interesting, uh, including uh, switching the existing fleet of both public and private uh, vehicles to EVs, um, public transportation uh, on demand, um, charging and energy, 
uh, including a hybrid system with uh, REST units combined with storage and uh, possibly in the future uh, testing of uh, autonomous driving. Um, so, uh, this uh, included uh, extensive works during the, uh, the last year and uh, we're, having, we're in the same procedure this year as well um, with the installation of uh, the first uh, public network of uh, EV chargers in uh, the island, in uh, key points uh, of, uh, of the island. Um, public EVs uh, for, donated to the police, the port police, the civil aviation service and the municipality. Um, uh, an extra subsidization program for the citizens of uh, Astipalia, uh, including taxi owners, natural persons and uh, local businesses. And uh, a public uh, on-demand transportation, uh, which will be promoted via uh, a smart application uh, to optimize transportation on the island, especially during uh, the summer months. Uh, the next uh, steps will include also uh, a, res, uh, a hybrid station that will cover most of uh, the island's energy needs. Um, and for this reason, uh, we supported the municipality to apply in the NSOI mechanism uh, in order to have uh, a local energy planning and mobility planning to, with, together with uh, the ongoing project in order to ensure that uh, the local community is taken care of and uh, the, local, the local benefit is maximized. So here are some first uh, interesting uh, approaches uh, that we, we see while planning mobility on the islands. It's very important to focus on the whole island, not, uh, which is really different from the, the urban areas while planning for urban areas. Uh, it's important to take uh, into account that tourists outnumber local population during summer. There is a need for light and flexible infrastructure instead of uh, heavy fixed infra and mass infrastructure used in, uh, in cities. Uh, we have very limited external connection connections. The, the public transport has to be light, personalized and flexible and we also need to focus a lot on uh, maritime transport. Uh, another interesting project where we have uh, interesting lessons learned is Kithno Smart Island. Uh, Kithnos is another non-interconnected island, uh, island with uh, around 1,600 uh, inhabitants with a long history of innovation that has been reborn in the few uh, past years. Uh, the, the project uh, includes an uh, an integrated approach about water management, street lighting, energy and smart grids, building and public space retrofitting, transport mobility and uh, waste management. And uh, focusing on the transport and mobility, uh, the focus uh, is in the adoption of e-mobility of course, uh, upgrading of port <coughs> infrastructure and uh, installing a solar PV station for green charging because we think this is a very important aspect uh, in uh, non-interconnected islands to, to come together with uh, e-mobility. Uh, so, uh, in more detail, uh, we, have a, to, we will upgrade the municipal fleet, install EV charging stations, e-bikes in the marinas, shared e-bikes, um, and uh, of course uh, the, the PV. So, uh, it's been a long way uh, planning this, uh, this project. There has been uh, local uh, community engagement activities. Um, we have uh, created a catalog for EVs covering municipality needs, uh, giving special focus to, to the EVs uh, from, uh, uh, that the, the local authorities need. Uh, there is a first uh, part of the fleet that is uh, uh, electrified and of course there are some special uh, EVs that are really useful for, uh, for the islands where for example the um, collection of waste is really difficult to be done in small uh, narrow roads of traditional uh, um, uh, settlements and uh, <laughs> such vehicles are, uh, mm -hmm. can prove really useful. So we had uh, the installation also of a public uh, EV charging network there and um, it's uh, been operating for one year and people really start to show interest. Um, the upgrade in, um, in port infrastructure is also uh, ongoing right now uh, with the replacement of pillars, shared electrical bytes, uh, installing of charging stations for electric boats and uh, smart street lighting. Um, 
So, uh, in order to uh, go to the lessons learned uh, that I promised, um, it's uh, first of all there are significant key challenges in the in the islands that need to be taken into account. Uh, the first and foremost is the limited grid capacity. It is necessary to have a close cooperation with the, with the DSO to plan together, not just. Uh, go to them uh, and request for uh, capacity, but uh, involve them as a key stakeholder in the whole planning procedure. And of course, uh, innovation is required too. Storage uh, can support the, um, uh, the implementation of, uh, of uh, the electrical capacity needed uh, in certain places where the grid is not easy to go. Uh, also, uh, resilience to extreme weather conditions is an important design parameter. Mm -hmm. uh, the salinity, the, um, the, the rain, the, the, the seawater are all very uh, deteriorating factors for the situation and maintenance of, uh, of the infrastructure. Uh, cabling and grounding works are also really challenging in islands, especially when you have to work inside traditional settlements where it's not easy to, uh, you know, uh, create underground cabling and so on. And there are a lot of uh, uh, safety measures that need to be taken into account. And of course, uh, there is a need to designate the EV charging spots in order to make them very clear that they are dedicated for this use because it's very easy for locals. Uh, to do just what they're used to and, uh, uh, okay. you know, just uh, use um, compatible vehicles in the, in the charging spots. So, in the, regarding the socioeconomic aspect, um, it is very important to understand that in small economies, uh, certain stakeholders are heavily affected from the transition to, to e-mobility, especially rent -a car businesses, gas stations, um, the, they, they feel threatened in a way by this whole transition. And it's very important, it's the role of the public sector to include them in the whole procedure. Uh, and we think that a just transition approach is the best approach to, to take care of, this, uh, of these groups because in such small local communities, uh, if there is a strong interest and opposition to such, um, uh, to such infrastructure, it, it, it simply cannot work. So it's very important to include all these stakeholders and uh, take care of them. And uh, the best way to do that is by co-investing and creating uh, participatory um, business models. Uh, like the energy communities. Uh, seasonality also needs, creates the need for cooperation between municipality and tourism sector. It's uh, very important to uh, understand that um, uh, during winter months the, the demand for charging is too low and the municipality cannot undertake the whole cost mm -hmm. uh, to cover the peak demand during uh, the summer months. So uh, it will be important to also cooperate and support Loc the local tourism sector, especially restaurants and hotels, in order to, ha to help them also accommodate charging infrastructure in their premises and uh, offer a whole package of uh, uh, charging services to the visitors of the island. Finally, it's very important to take into account the traditional architecture of the, of the islands and uh, have an aesthetic adaptation of the charging infrastructure, which also gives the opportunity uh, for a unique island branding. We understand that all uh, charging vendors want to promote and sell their own uh, branding and so on, but it's important for islands uh, to uh, adapt this uh, branding to the local conditions and um, adapt it to the, match it with the local uh, green branding of the island. Uh, so that's all. I think I'm in the 12 minutes right now. I still have two slides uh, regarding some projects that promote uh, e-mobility in maritime transport, uh, which is also an uh, important aspect. I will just use another 10 seconds to just go through that with them. Uh, one is Antiparos, where promoting the concept of uh, cooperation between public and private sector. It's a common project uh, funded by NESOI, uh, including the municipality of Adiparos and the Paros Antiparos Ferry Cooperative. And um, also the Smart Clean and Green Marinas project in uh, Naxos and Kufonisi. 
Uh, and do, I would like to, to say that we're really happy that we will work together with the um, Secretariat in the second phase uh, called for technical assistance, uh, working for the decarbonization of the, sea, of the fishing and touristic fleet uh, in the islands of uh, Kalimnos, Patmos, and um, Lipsi. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another uh, very good presentation. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's good to see how you have developed and trying to do your best to make sure that everyone is engaged and everyone has this, the same goal. Now I will give the floor to, to Raul that is online and will be doing a different presentation because he will be presenting from the point of view of the investor, but at the end of the day it's the same uh, uh, objectives is to um, deploy the infrastructure, deploy uh, these business models. Raul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to the forum. I think uh, the forum is a good platform to, to talk about what is needed, what is urgent, and that uh, the, the islands are an important part of this transition and that uh, strategies have to be built in a way uh, that uh, the islands are not the ones suffering the bear of brunt of uh, the lack of decision making or slow decision making. Um, that said, um, firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Rahul Pratap Singh. I'm the investment manager at Deutsche Asset Management, which is basically the investment manager for the European Energy Efficiency Fund. The, uh, the Energy Efficiency Fund basically is an ins instrument of the European Commission, which was built in 2011. And the fund aims to uh, provide financing to different projects at uh, public infrastructure levels so that the, uh, the money coming from uh, entities like the European Commission, EIP, Casa Depositi, Prestiti, generally is moving towards investments which are helping improve the infrastructure which needs uh, uh, transition as we move into the 2050 goals of uh, carbon neutrality and net zero emissions. With that said, let's move into the slides. Uh, I understand that I have 12 minutes, so I will prioritize uh, discussion on uh, uh, the project that we have invested in, and then I'll give a quick glimpse of what the fund has been doing and what this, where the fund stands in the beginning. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the fund is basically an instrument of the European Commission. It has been built in 2012, almost 10 years now. And uh, since inception, we have done some investments uh, in various European member states. Uh, there are some numbers to show that we have currently 140 million euros committed. And since inception, 175 million. Overall, the fund has a very good investment credit quality. Uh, the most important figure which I wanted to share is that on an aggregate level, the fund has managed to save 64% CO2 emissions reduction on an annual basis. And uh, the fund is required to do 30%, but we are proud that we managed to deliver 64% and uh, we want to be at that level going forward. In addition to that, uh, the fund requires to uh, reduce the primary energy requirement of different sectors in which we invest, uh, mainly European, uh, a, a mainly energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean urban transportation. So 1.5 million megawatt hours of cumulative primary energy savings saved since the inception of the fund. We can move to the next slide, please. The fund basically has uh, ability to invest in equity, debt. Uh, or mezzanine structures, which makes the fund extremely flexible towards uh, any financing needs of projects. Uh, the projects have to belong to the public sector, so it could be uh, tenders coming from the cities, municipalities to upgrade infrastructure, could be street lighting infrastructure, clean urban transportation in infrastructure, or renewable energy infrastructure. The fund requires, as I mentioned, two main objectives to be achieved, 30% savings in CO2 and 30% saving in primary energy requirement. We can move to the next slide. So this is a little bit about where the fund comes from, who are the investors in the fund. In the center bottom, you will see the investors are European Commission, EIB, DBU, uh, uh, GDP, and Generali. And as you see, this is uh, created in a way that the 
fund is able to engage in uh, in uh, slightly risky investments where the 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 last tranche which is the risk tranche is taken by the european commission which is around 100 million euros so the fund can enter into equity investments as well so as to help projects to take off and then help the european infrastructure next slide please next slide please this is a little bit of a snapshot of where the fund stands as of March 2022. 140 million euros invested in different cities, as you see. We have Germany, Great Britain, Netherlands, Spain, France, it, uh, Italy, Romania, Lithuania, Portugal. 18% uh, exposure in equity, 30% and uh, 52 respectively in debt kind of instruments. And further on, we have a split into clean urban transportation is at 10%. Uh, renewable energy 22 and energy efficiency at 68 percent next slide please this is once again a little bit describe descri description of uh, the different investments that we have on the portfolio as of now there are two investments which have already uh, matured which are bolore and spl whereas all the others are ongoing investments which are really the fund is really proud of each one of them is doing extremely well and is a good distribution of the investment between the various sectors next slide please next this comes the most interesting part which is where i want to sp uh, spend more of my time this is uh, a project that we entered uh, towards the end of uh, 2019 it's the joint venture uh, on clean urban transportation uh, the project developer has created a bus uh, which is uh, what uh, is the, it's the it's instrument of our investment. So we invest in a joint venture. The bus is, uh, is, is able to provide to municipalities, cities, mobility as a service. It's a very important concept. Uh, unlike in the past where the buses or public infrastructure would be on the balance sheet of the municipalities, uh, which then needs to be financed through resources of the municipality, restricted the municipality from investing in, in an aggressive manner and improving the infrastructure. A solution like this basically allows the municipalities and cities to move away from making investment and on the contrary uh, benefit from paying as per the requirement needs. So this is an example where uh, we have co-invested with the developer of the project and then the joint venture which has been created is offering the service as a one-stop stop for all the needs of the municipality, which means it includes maintenance, it includes uh, electric charging, it includes um, uh, uh, supply of buses in case of breakdown and, and say what it. In this way, the municipality has to only focus on defining the routes on which the buses will run and ensure that the, uh, that the passengers are only focused on getting from one point to another. The, the 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 good part of this investment is that it is fully uh, supplied with charging from renewable energy sources, and as a consequence of being an electric bus, it it re it reaches almost 100 percent of uh, CO2 savings as compared to the baseline, and also primary energy savings as compared to the previous infrastructure that the city has. We have these buses running already in Lithuania. Uh, we have 20 months of experience. Uh, these months, uh, these buses have been certified by uh, for EU level safety, and all the components of these buses. I repeat, all components of these buses are coming from within Europe. So this is fully Europe-based bus, and which is competing with the top-notch buses in the market. And uh, it's now uh, with 20 months of track record, around 250 thousand kilometers it has demonstrated an availability of 24 7 97.7 percent availability rate uh, in, in in on these roads you can move to the next slide please so here are some features of these buses which are right now running on uh, lithuania in a city called klaipeda uh, some important points that i would like to highlight from uh, an overall esg perspective that these buses are 100% sustainable in the sense they are made from PET plus, the PET bottles that we are throwing away. These buses have been fabricated from the PET bottle plastic, which is recycled, and it's fired by 100% renewable energy source. Uh, these buses have a life expectancy of 30%, uh, 30 years, and interestingly, at the end of the life of the bus, 
the bus can be fully recycled into another bus. So we are basically talking about circular economy applied at a mobility scale. And uh, with the first buses running on the streets, uh, they are receiving full service from the producers and online, online monitoring. So the city municipality is able to see the quality of transportation which is made available to the citizen and to see and monitor the performance of this solution which has been newly deployed. Uh, in addition to that, there are a few more points on the efficiency of these buses. Uh, I mentioned that these are low energy consumption buses. From the track record of 20 months, they have demonstrated that they require around 0.72 kilowatt hours per kilometer, which is absolutely very low number as compared to the previous energy requirement or the buses running on fossils. These buses are eight tons in weight. If you compare them to the traditional buses, which were almost double the weight, uh, these buses require less of energy to drive. They still carry 92 passengers. Uh, typical buses will carry around 80 passengers, so they are able to carry the same number of passengers. And with a single charge uh, for inside city routes, uh, they are able to do uh, the 100 kilometer circuit. So when, if you notice in European cities, uh, the buses take around the loop and come at the halt, and then they, and then they take the passengers again, and they go around the same route. But that 10 minutes of pit stop is sufficient to recharge the bus to go another around of 100 kilometers. Uh, the developers have come out with more models. So uh, they also have models which will charge three hours and then they will run longer routes of 400 to 500 kilometers. So these are more options which these uh, uh, the joint venture is able to offer to cities and municipalities. And last but not the least, if you look at the components which a traditional bus has, it is around 12,000 components which are going into a conventional bus. The way the developers have streamlined these buses that they require standardized 1,500 components and all of them coming from right inside of Europe. So you don't have to wait for supply chain issues or wait for other producers or worry about sanctions and geographies which could be of threat to Europe. Lastly, I just uh, put a few photos of uh, the buses which are actually available and will be available shortly. Uh, there are two main varieties of buses that they guys have uh, developed. One is supercharging, a 10 minutes charging pit stop where they are used for inter, uh, small city circuits around 100 kilometers. And then there is another option, Dance 530, which is for longer routes. It takes around three hours to charge this. Uh, and then with one charge, it can go between 400 to 500 kilometers. And there's one more model which is coming up and it's in progress is basically to double the passenger capacity to go up to 160 passengers. And this one uh, will, will be available shortly in 2024 onwards. I think that's uh, the conclusion of my slide, but I would just like to point out a couple of things. Uh, if you look on an annual basis, around 450 billion bus journeys are done on every year on this planet. So obviously buses are a significant contribution to public transport systems. And unfortunately in Europe, 50% of the buses are still suffering from a bad labeling because they belong to Euro 3 uh, labels or even older. And therefore, it is important that the bus fleet and the charging infrastructure is available so that we can step by step renew the current infrastructure and reduce the footprint of uh, CO2 emissions by, by the current buses and the public infrastructure. I think uh, that's it from my side. Uh, if you have any questions or any other further comments, I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Raul. Uh, yeah, clap your hands to, to Raul. So. Uh, um, just a great presentation, and it's uh, just wonderful to see that it's possible to build uh, buses which are very, uh, um, their weight, uh, so that were eight tons and they are running uh, a very efficient way. So for that reason, I think that the market is, is evolving in a, in a fast pace, and now we are delivering infrastructure, or we are delivering uh, uh, cars and buses in this case, that are efficient and can um, run against, in terms of economics and in terms of efficiency, run against the traditional ones. So now I would invite um, Maria. Maria is a research fellow at the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Uh, basically, um, 
um, with an open question for you um, to comment a bit on the presentations before, if you feel like. But um, uh, um, one of the questions that I would like to ask you, and I know that you have been doing some of the, of the research, um, is about the, the, the fact that Sweden is uh, among the leading countries uh, when it comes to electrical buses uh, deployment. So uh, if you could talk a little bit about what lessons um, have you uh, uh, taken from that experience and what can be brought to this uh, context of the, of the islands? And welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'd like to say that I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, I wish I was here, uh, there with you at my home country. Unfortunately, not possible this time, hopefully next time. Uh, I was really impressed with all the presentations and very inspired. You talked, uh, you talked about my favorite things, uh, establishing charging infrastructure in different places around the world. You talked about buses. Uh, my PhD research was about scaling up electric bus systems uh, in Sweden, but then also in other parts of the world. And we have done a lot of work uh, in this topic, I would say, which is very interesting. I think the key factor for success when it comes to electric bus deployment is uh, the fact that we have specific routes. It makes electrification quite easy. It's easier to plan compared to other other types of uh, market segments, let's say, for electrification. So there was this part of the predictability that gave this early start to buses compared to other uh, market segments. And then the other success factor for Sweden was definitely the political will and the participation of the public authorities in the process. So procurement instruments, I think procurement was the single most important factor. Uh, and now we have a very fast deployment, uh, among the fastest deployment of electric buses around Europe, there is no uh, tender going on right now in Sweden, which does not consider at least a small amount of electric buses. And that's why procurement has been a really important instrument, because um, the authorities were able to set some goals uh, with regard to the local prerequisite and with an extra addition of ambition. And then the market had to deliver, uh, and the operators and manufacturers had to deliver the solutions um, according to the needs. Uh, so, yeah, I would say those two, predictability and procurement, are the other two most important factors. And, of course, the local manufacturers were also very much involved in the processes. Question to you. Uh, of course, not about the, the Sweden market, although I know that you have been doing also some, some work or you know about the market. But um, I would bring this to, the, to more uh, on the Greek side. So what would you consider that would be the best uh, models uh, that we can use to finance these types of projects and considering the local context also uh, and the islands, of course? Thank you very much. I think Greece uh, has selected uh, a well-known model in many European countries based on what we call SPHEO. Mainly, the central government gives money to the local governments, and they make their requirements. They make uh, a number of charging stations. This is a good model, because you have at least the minimum number of charging stations. And it's a bad model, because you have just that, the minimum number of charging stations. So we need to go one step ahead. and. Um, as uh, HELIEV, um, as uh, National Association on Electrification, the first idea is to try to combine that with the Dutch model of private pu uh, public partnership, meaning in big cities and in touristic places like here, you can say, okay, I have in roads, for example, with SPHEO, I don't know, 10 charging stations. Then I open a tender for a public, uh, private partnership or a private partnership, if you like, for another 20, 30, for 10 years, for 15 years. And then you get to a richer situation. And there is a peculiarity. The private uh, stations publicly used. Example, this hotel. Every hotel is installing and will install a number of charging points. These will be used on priority for the clients. But whenever they are not used by the clients, they could come into the public network, and in return, the hotel could, of course, get money from the charging, but in addition, already it gets some funding, subsidization for the stations. It could get 
a higher subsidization. So a number of different models coming together, aiming at the end of providing not the minimum, the optimal charging network and facility. Thank you. Now I would give the floor to everyone uh, of you. Uh, back there, I don't know if you have any questions. Okay, we have one question. Just one second for the microphone. Hello? Yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, I've not heard anybody mention vehicle to building or vehicle to grid technology and the opportunities to use electric vehicles as part of a storage solution. Has that been considered by any of the panelists? And if so, what, what are the conclusions as to the maturity of that technology? Okay, I don't know who wants to take this one. Okay, uh, go yes. ahead. We have been uh, using that uh, quite extensively. One example is the Nobel project where a whole uh, city in Spain uh, used uh, quite a number of, I think more than 1,000 electric vehicles with V2G. And uh, it is amazing the impact, the dynamic impact it had, the stabilization of the network. Uh, but there, we didn't have this limitation that we have in Greece, that we have only two chargings, uh, the cheap in the night and the expensive in the morning. There you had actually built by us, plus a company, dynamic agents. So you would say, I want to charge my vehicle by tomorrow morning 8 in the cheapest way. And then it would sell and buy, sell and buy, of course, with a cutoff that you don't recharge 20 times per day. Of course, that's not good for the battery. And it would optimize. So V2G is important. One information uh, for our charging station here in uh, the Hellenic Institute of Transport charging station that is to be installed in the roads, it will include the V2G module. So we are going to have the possibility to test that also here. Thank you. I don't know if uh, any of the online participants wants to say something. Mm. Maybe, yes. if I may, but I think Maria as well. <laughs> yeah, you go first. I correctly. <laughs> okay, I just wanted a short comment to add to that. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we recommend installing smart charging infrastructure, is really to kind of take the first step in this direction of being able to actually interact with the grid between the electric vehicle and the grid. It's true that currently in V2G projects, it's a lot of uh, demonstrations. Uh, and that's why we're first of all looking at smart charging. So really this possibility of scheduling, when is the charging going to happen depending on the, on the grid needs. Um, but the V2G aspect is something that we will look into in uh, a policy manual on grid integration that we hope to publish by the end of the year so that I, I will be able to give you more information on that on that time. Thank you. Uh. And I'd like to add that uh, last year uh, we looked uh, on behalf of uh, the Director General for Energy uh, together with Lucia from Pinky and other colleagues. So we looked together into the barriers to smart charging uh, deployment around Europe. And I would say that uh, the barriers are regulatory mainly and standardization related. This needs to go faster. It's not something on the technology per se. Uh, I want to add that for the island context, vehicle to grid can, uh, can save a lot of money for sure. And we have a bigger flexibility maybe because we're talking about smaller electric grids, much more control uh, of, of the local uh, actors uh, with, uh, with regard to the flexibility. So it can definitely be um, be considered in the future. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, you have another question? Okay. Go ahead. It should be. It is on. Okay, Olivier Hogan from the Pacific Community. My question is for Mr. Markopoulos. I have seen that uh, you have mentioned um, Volkswagen as a partner in the, in the project. So I would like to know more about what is the role in this project and how did you attract them to be part of this project? Municipality of um, International Affairs uh, with the Volkswagen Group. 
uh, they were searching for uh, for an island to uh, you know conduct like uh, an innovative uh, project and from the other side uh, the Greek DSO Hedno and the Greek Ministry of Environment for years have been uh, trying to implement a pilot energy project in one of the non-reconnected islands to test storage together with uh, renewable energy systems in small isolated systems. So uh, many of the studies were already complete and mature and uh, it was a good combination like a coincidence uh, that the Volkswagen group uh, was looking for uh, a place like to act as a test bed and we already uh, from the Greek side uh, had prepared uh, a significant part of the studies uh, for, for the energy side. So these two came together and uh, it was decided that uh, Astipaila is, uh, is a good uh, choice. Uh, I think that uh, also the Halki example uh, is uh, in this direction. I mean, uh, Citroën and other very big private uh, companies and investors were um, uh, were happy, and this uh, goes for all islands. Uh, private investors are happy to to do this uh, these projects. Uh, they provide visibility. They can test new technologies and new services. Uh, it's very good for them. Uh, it can be also very good for the islands, providing visibility and. Um, uh, also uh, uh, improving the <laughs> uh, life uh, on the island, but uh, what we've seen so far is that such project needs uh, a lot of uh, careful planning and uh, of course uh, it would be better not to just each time uh, try to, to do something new when, when the chance appears, but to, to organize and create the whole um, framework for innovative projects in the islands, including the local community from the beginning and before the project, rather than trying to you know, implement uh, what e an investor has in mind and trying then to um, adapt it to the local conditions. So that's the story behind the project. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Uh, I have a quick question, and that's regarding, we have representatives here from the islands. We always say that in the electrification of, uh, let's say, installation of the public charging in electrification, that is the easiest to start from publicly owned vehicles. However, in a lot of cases in small muni municipalities, it's mainly the service vehicles that the municipalities own, not necessarily passenger vehicles. So what is your experiences or suggestions maybe to municipalities on how to make sure to start, let's say, with their own case, but also uh, that, let's say, infrastructure to be used for uh, touristic purposes as well? Okay, do, is for a specific person or for the panel? For the panel. I don't know, Maria, uh, since you have been working on this topic of the, the goods versus passengers, if you wanna, Yes, yes. I, I think that the, the freight and goods transport in general are better cases of electrification, easier, let's say, because there is, there is demand. Uh, it can be uh, also economically more feasible to discuss electrification in those segments since uh, fuel costs are a big part of the business. So being able to electrify the segments and reduce the costs is a very good example and makes companies want to invest more, most probably. I think it has to do with understanding the transport flows in a given area, uh, which is important. And it's much easier to do in an island context because we have this, the physical limitations of being on an island. So in this way, it is possible to, to see where the peaks are in the transport volumes, where you have the bottlenecks, where you have the, the, the less demand, and then plan accordingly so that you at least can cover base demand for services with electrification. And then saying in the cases where you have peaks, you either work with modular solutions, uh, where passenger cars can also be attached or tourists or anyone else, or you work with, with a little bit of uh, sifting loads, trying to shift the charging of the service vehicles in the night, maybe when the demand is less from the passenger side. So it's, uh, it's a combination, and we need to have a better understanding of the transport flows before starting anything else. Uh, 
I have to say that uh, I heard about seasonality as well, being a, a big barrier or a challenge, let's say, and that has to do with the summer and the tourism sector in, in the Greek context. In, in Sweden, it has to do more with uh, the skiing holidays. It's always about the touristic destinations. The problem there has been solved by adding modular charging infrastructure, like containers that have the storage solution, they have the opportunity to charge, and they can be transported on, on a on a quite normal uh, track, let's say. So in this way, you can move them around and you can uh, be flexible and solve this, these peaks that would drive very much the investment cost without any actual reason, I think. Uh, so it's, it's some interesting solutions being tested for that. Thank you. I'm not sure if, if you want to react or no. Uh, yes, um, I think it's, uh, I totally agree with uh, Maria, but uh, I would like to add that um, it's important, I think, for uh, the local authorities to, to give the good example, as we say in Greek. I mean, uh, like starting with some uh, pilot infrastructure to help people uh, get used to, to, to that kind of infrastructure. and. Uh, I think that it's important to try to include the local businesses from early on, to explain the benefits, to try to work together and um, uh, create, uh, see it as a part of the branding, see it as an opportunity rather than um, an inconvenience uh, because there's a lot of work needed to accommodate the infrastructure, but you can see it as an opportunity and really uh, create uh, added value uh, out of it uh, through the green branding of the island and uh, this whole um, uh, participatory procedure. Thank you. We had some questions up front here. I'm not sure if you still have them. Yes, uh, p partly it was already uh, answered. Uh, my question was uh, going in the direction of seasonality. I'm coming from the archipelago in the northern Adriatic, and most of the tourists are coming uh, there by car, and we are talking about three months. So uh, uh, certainly in these three months there will be uh, a high demand for, for chargers, but then the rest uh, of the year uh, mm -hmm. will not exist almost. No? So uh, what are the business models uh, uh, to, that are um, uh, suitable for, for such conditions? Okay, not sure. Uh, um, maybe I would challenge Raoul to, to accept on this one because um, this will entails with uh, with uh, the financial or the, the the metrics of the, the the business. So how do you consider when whenever there is this case of not having a full year of the the system running? So uh, what is your perspective and how do you analyze this? So let's uh, look at an example uh, in wind energy. We have some similar or solar energy. When you are sizing the project for investment, you're looking at the seasonality very closely. And there are peak periods and then there are lull periods. So this is a similar assessment that you have to do for the transportation sector or where the public charging infrastructure is involved. You basically have to have uh, uh, extrapolation of the demand to estimate more or less an aggregate 12 months of uh, load, base load. And then from that you will uh, dimension the financing and the investment. Um, you should be, the, the, the investment community or investor should be able to scale up and down the size of the infrastructure to, to fit the overall requirement of, uh, of the, or, or the overall business challenge. Uh, the other way to, to deal with this would be to elongate the duration of such tenders or such project lives. So the longer the number of years, then you have a chance to reach the payback period and then the returns on the, on the, on the projects. But all of this requires a few pilots in the very beginning which will sort of set the momentum for setting these, uh, these extrapolation activities for the first 12 months of base load extrapolation. And that would follow with uh, an assessment at the financial level, followed by inflow of uh, money from the investors. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you want to react or someone else wants to react. Um, um, if sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a bit uh, <laughs> delayed. Um, 
just uh, maybe to just out highlight uh, something that I think uh, Petros Markopoulos mentioned before in terms of working with the local businesses. I think that's very important in terms of addressing the seasonality. If you have hotels that have charging infrastructure, um, this can be opened up to the local needs, um, and this will kind of shift right uh, in the in the in the highest season you will have a lot of utilization of these charging stations from the clients and then outside you will have a little bit less so that's kind of a, a very efficient actually way of uh, of using this infrastructure so that's um, maybe a way to also advertise it to the local businesses okay uh, picking what you said uh, uh, ask uh, uh, petrus uh, um, in terms of business models, uh, uh, how can we uh, think about business models that are more dedicated to islands than, because we have these issues, we have the tourism, we have several uh, different issues. Uh, uh, so could you highlight us uh, um, a bit? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, I think that uh, for small and uh, medium islands, uh, we have to it's more difficult to have a free, totally open market approach. Uh, we need to treat them like uh, in a, uh, as an ecosystem, and uh, it would be good to, as I mentioned earlier, to have all or uh, as much as possible uh, stakeholders on board. So, uh, going on with a, a common vision, including, of course, the municipality and uh, local businesses, possibly through a co-investment scheme like an energy community uh, through which we can achieve economies of scale, uh, common branding and common identity, and of course um, in good close cooperation with the, with the DSO. Uh, I think uh, this is um, a business plan that can uh, really work and uh, also achieve a, a swift and fast transition uh, from the whole island and not leave <laughs> uh, any players or stakeholders behind. Uh, so, yes, that's it. So, Angel, so I would now uh, um, move to you because when we talk about electrical mobility, we sometimes talk about innovation. So, there is a lot of innovation, you know, whether it's on the technology side, because we are seeing technology evolving every year but also on the business model. So we talk about innovation. Um, in that case, we need also to create innovative financing schemes. So uh, uh, there is this uh, ecosystem of innovation that is needed. So w what is your view and how can we address this, uh, um, mainly on Greek islands, but uh, uh, you can also talk about other islands. So, well, so what is your view and experience? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, innovation and um, financing of innovation need, need to go hand uh, by hand. Um, I was yesterday in Leipzig in another conference like here and uh, discussing with uh, a director of EIB. Um, we came to the conclusion that it's important that EIB makes uh, an agreement with uh, the European Association of uh, Transport Research Institutes that I am the president and get the know-how. So they have all the research institutes of Europe know-how on how uh, to optimize uh, innovation. And um, I'll give you an example why this is very important. I'll give you a bet. I don't know how many of you are gamblers here. <laughs> Normally I'm not a gambler, but I'm in a gambling mood today. So I'll give you a bet. In my work, I'm an automotive engineer, it takes 10 to 15 years from concept to market full deployment, TRL 9. So, I'll tell you, I cannot imagine that the future is this fast charging station uh, around the street, where in the best case you have 20, 20 minutes for full charging. In a normal oil station, charging vehicle to vehicle, you have one minute on average. 20 minutes? How many fast charging stations do you think we're going to make also for the summer time when we have all the tourists? So what's the solution? And I'm coming and telling you, remember that after 10 years, I'll be just about pension. Inductive charging, wireless inductive charging. In the past, it was dangerous. A cut going between the vehicle and the street could be burned, but now it's not. 
It's still a problem that American companies have all the technology and they are, it's expensive, but this is going better. So in the future, and I can tell you we had this kind of tests both in France, around Paris, and in uh, Karlsruhe in Germany, you go on a highway for 10 kilometers dynamically with 50 to 100 kilometers per hour, and you fully charge 200 kilometers your vehicle. This is the future, and I see the future here in the roads between Lindos and the main, uh, and the main uh, island, uh, the city of Rhodes, in one lane of 10 kilometers, just going there and charging your vehicle. This is innovation, this is things that investors should have in mind because it can be a game changer. Yes, it can. Uh, um, I'm recently an uh, EV charger user because uh, uh, I bought one car, and uh, that will be the perfect solution for me because t uh, 20 minutes is the minimum or the minimum that we have. Sometimes we have to spend more time, which is, in terms of logistics, makes all, all the difference. So that will be a, a, actually a game changer. Uh, um, so, so I would um, invite Julia to to also address this because uh, um, you have these policy uh, um, recommendations, but uh, on the other hand, this technology part is always changing, so we need to adapt very fast the technology, and, and we see that this does not take uh, so many years as it used to take, so things are happening every day, so we need to be adapt very, very fast. How do you see this? Yes, that's true. Uh, the, the innovation is, is very quick and, and one of the other, um, let's say, um, business models that allows a faster charge is battery swapping that I kind of uh, overrun uh, uh, before. Um, I think it's, it's a bit challenging for someone uh, that needs to build out the infrastructure now to say, okay, I'm going to be going into wireless charging because it's not that uh, up to the best technology, but it's always good to have a look and see, okay, uh, this is coming up. What can I do to um, to support this, to to try and, and engage uh, in, in this direction? Uh, just for the context, this uh, policy brief uh, was really in the context of supporting uh, low and median income economies, so that's why we didn't look at uh, wireless charging options, because it's something that is uh, not yet really on the market. Um, but we did look at uh, this battery swapping idea, which is kind of what is happening in Asia a lot uh, currently to charge in a very quick time, just because you can take out the battery and change it for a charged one. So that's something that is very popular, especially for two and three wheelers. Uh, in Asia, but that has developed as well for electric buses, for example, where it's more easy to work with manufacturers to standardize this. So um, before I go for a uh, last round on the, on the audience, I would invite Raoul just to, to, for two questions, because um, I was impressed by the, the efficiency of the, of the vehicle. So my first question is where those buses are, are product, produced. I understand that they they were made of parts or, or across Europe but to, to understand where they are assembled. And um, what is the track record of these buses along the, 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 the time? Yeah, sure. I did elude upon uh, where these buses were produced. So uh, these are, as I mentioned, um, these are certified EU road safety buses uh, produced in Lithuania. And um, as I was mentioning, a typical bus uh, would require now the, around 12,000 parts, which are imported from different parts of the world, uh, including China. Uh, this bus, because of its standardization, it has uh, now reduced its components to 1,500, and all of them are from within the EU member states. So as I was mentioning, this is a labeled EU bus, which is allowing to solve this mobility problem. Uh, the other important aspect was about circular economy. Uh, plastic has been a problem for the planet, not just for Europe. And then this, the fact that these uh, buses are produced from the, the, the pet bottles, uh, which are basically garbage for us, and uh, it's, it's a massive problem to, to get uh, how to use them. These buses are created from recycled pet bottles and uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a lifetime of around 30 years of service. So uh, at the end of the lifetime, again, as I was mentioning, 
these buses as fully recyclable. So then you are not creating any garbage from garbage. You basically can use it, use it perennially. So uh, all the plastic that we have been producing can somehow be put to use and then can be recycled into uh, a productive material which uh, is meeting all the safety standards of the European market and uh, is, is reducing our the, 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 the pollution footprint that we have in terms of garbage and uh, on the plastic that we throw out. Uh, the second question is about the, the, the track record of these buses. There was mentioning uh, the first buses started rolling out in the European markets. Uh, the first cities to adopt them was Klaipeda in, in Lithuania. Now these buses have around 20 months of track record uh, in those cities, 250,000 kilometers, almost 290 kilometers per day. And uh, uh, the ones that the city used were 100 kilometers uh, models. Basically, the buses goes around in the loop uh, in the circuit, uh, finishes the trip, 10 minute pit stop, where it refills the passengers and also recharges the battery, does the entire loop again. So uh, so far uh, for these 20 months, 24/7 availability of bus service. Uh, the bus comes along with the charging solution. So uh, the, the supplier of the buses also provide the charging infrastructure, which is at the pit stop where it uh, restarts its journey again. And uh, it has delivered 97 point, uh, over 97% availability over these 20 months of uh, track record that we have. Uh, another important thing which I think was mentioned during the presentation was uh, performance under challenging weather conditions. So these 20 months, uh, the buses have seen from minus 20 degrees of temperature to 35 degrees temperature. And uh, with those in mind, uh, the bus was delivering 97 and above percent availability. And the last point is that these buses are right now uh, running on 100% uh, green energy sources. So the wind energy which is in the locality is basically which is charging these buses for doing all these routes. So overall, um, for 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 uh, eight minutes pit stop for recharging the buses and running at 97% uh, availability for the passengers, the buses have done well. And uh, now they are being produced in different models based on the requirement of different uh, cities and adapted to the requirements of different cities so that uh, they can be now rolled out to other cities in, in the European market. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to see a project that it's not just an EV project, but it's a circular economy project, so a project that thinks on the life expectation of the, the buses and, and the future. Um, I would kindly ask if you have any questions to the audience. Last opportunity, of course, uh, we can always uh, reach out to the to at least to the, uh, the the speakers that are here in the coffee break or to the speakers that are online. You can drop us a, a line afterwards. If there aren't any questions, I would follow the same order of the the presentations and give a one minute opportunity for closing the session. So I will start with Julia. Uh, Julia, just. Uh, some few words uh, to close the session. Thank you very much. Um, this was a really interesting uh, session because it gave me a very good overview of something that is very concrete, the implementation of charging infrastructure in an island. It's, uh, it's really great to see how uh, different stakeholders are working on implementing things in a very specific, very concrete context. And I think some of our main recommendations like, okay, look at the future, look at what is happening, and make sure that you install the right infrastructure for your context is really something uh, that you are actually already doing. And, uh, and so I think this is really positive, and uh, I, um, I really want to thank you very much to, for uh, inviting me here, and uh, hope to see much more uh, innovation coming from the EU islands. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Julia. We are the ones saying thank you. Petros, uh, just a few words. Yes, uh, yeah, I want to thank you as well. It was uh, really interesting, uh, great insights and input. I believe that uh, this cooperation of all uh, aspects and uh, from all sides, uh, both regarding uh, policy, uh, innovation, uh, technology, and of course uh, the local uh, level, uh, they can bring really great uh, results and uh, it's very good that 
uh, with such opportunities, we come here, discuss, exchange experiences, and uh, understand how can we can even uh, promote further uh, immobility and uh, especially in the islands that are really ideal test beds for uh, this uh, technology. So thanks a lot again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Raoul? Well, thank you again uh, for having me at the forum. I think uh, we touched upon really interesting points from policy side to examples of projects in the city. Uh, my, my personal takeaway and important message for others as well is that uh, there is a lot of funding available for solutions. What is missing at times is policy makers' decisions and giving a clear uh, direction of how the things will move ahead. Um, uh, another important thing is from going away from a traditional uh, um, a financing scheme where municipalities would have a lot of assets on its balance sheet and that would restrict them to uh, do further improvements in the infrastructure is to go away from this model to a pay-as-you-go model for public infrastructure. And this will allow them to have flexibility and then it will allow the developers to have the initiative to improve the technology so as to keep delivering the service but also improve the returns for their own investment. So this way you are neatly tying in the policy, the direction, the infrastructure and the initiative for and the incentive for the developers to do uh, the good things and the right things so as to make the change that is needed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the advice and for, for being here, Raul. So Maria? I have been really impressed by the examples I saw today. Uh, it's very cool to see that uh, concrete things are happening. Uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful to be part of this and the discussion, of course. Uh, my, my key messages or takeaways, I would say, the first one is that uh, there are a lot of mundane aspects, like the boring aspects that are the enemy of innovation. We have the innovation in place happening, but there are a lot of administrative or regulatory details, for example, payments for the charging, uh, sharing of services, establishing uh, infrastructure permits, work permits, for example, to dig for the chargers. These are kind of mundane tasks that we need to pay, pay attention to, uh, so let's do that. And then I wanted to also highlight that uh, we talk a lot about the financing, I've run quite a lot of calculations for different electrification cases. There is no case that electrification is worse than the fossil alternative. It is at least equally good. And we are in front of a great opportunity right now with the increasing fossil fuel prices to push even further for electrification, not just because it's good for the environment, but also because it's, it's a more cost-effective case. Uh, it's the diesel price in every calculation that drives the electrification rate, actually, which is quite interesting. It's not the electricity price. So right now we have the opportunity and we have the setup context. Uh, it's very important to discuss now about the equity of that transition, for which actors we prepare the chargers, for which actors we prepare the cars, to which actors we sell, and which actors we involve in the processes. So it has to be equitable, and it's important to have public authorities on board so that uh, it happens in the right way and with the right costs for the transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, Angelos, yeah. Thanks for a really interesting and integral uh, uh, panel. Um, my concluding remark would be that uh, since we speak about financing, it's not all about money. In many cases, it's about incentives. So, for example, I give you the example of Schiphol, where a big number of taxis must be electric. Actually, they are Teslas. Think about instead of providing extra money to taxis, saying that in this island, 30% of the taxis at the airport and the harbor licensed are only electric, and making the enabling infrastructure for them, of course. So let's also think along the lines of incentives as part of the integral uh, package. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have the pleasure now to, to close the session. And um, my main takeaway is that we need all to talk, policymakers, investors, project developers, we need all to talk because it's not an easy way to develop business models, especially on islands where we have this seasonability, so we don't have people all the time or uh, so many people all the time. So we have this peak, so we have to control it. So 
and it's not an easy one, so we should all come together and engage and discuss and move forward, take decisions and move forward, which sometimes we discuss a lot, but we do not take decisions, so it's important to take decisions. Also, as a last note, I would invite all of you to visit the, the website of the, um, the Secretariat and to see what we are doing. We are trying also to do this matchmaking between project developers and investors, bridging these. So we invite you to go there, to visit, to contact us uh, if you have some doubts or if you have a project and you need to, to contact some investors. We are open to do that and th that's uh, part of our, our role. And um, a final message to the speakers uh, um, online, to the speakers here. Thank you very much. It was quite easy for me to, to manage this panel because you are experts, real experts, so it was quite easy for me. Now I would go for a round of applause and say thank you again uh, uh, for this panel. Thank you.